Hello, my name is Steven Carraher. Uh, the kids call me Coach Carr for short. Uh, today, I get the pleasure of talking to you about math anxiety in education. This leads us to our first question, which is, what exactly is math anxiety? Now, in the research that I did, the most common definition came from these two researchers that you see on the screen, uh, Patricia Buckley and Sheila Rabordi in 1982. The definition that they gave was, it's described as an irrational dread of mathematics that interferes with manipulating numbers and solving mathematical problems with a variety of everyday life and academic situations. So it does not have to just be in a academic setting. Now that you have the basic definition, the next question that we want to go over is how are the students actually affected by this? Now the first way that it can affect them is just uh, physically. It has some of the same characteristics as normal anxiety. So these are the things that we can see. Like for instance on here we talk about sweaty palms, being sick, and vomiting. It almost makes you think of some m and you know, some knees weak, arms are heavy, and how there's vomit on their sweater already. Now, what we can't see, though, is the emotional responses. These uh, are going to have a negative effect on the students. Uh, they're going to, like it says on here, they could feel less confidence, have a poor belief in their ability to cope with the task, and feel poorly skilled. Intrusive and inhibitory thoughts can arise in the individual in a disruptive and involuntary way that uh, with outbreaks of hopelessness, worry, and feel of failure. So they do not feel like they can actually accomplish the goals that we're trying to set out for them. So these physical and emotional responses can uh, will lead to some cognitive responses. So what I mean by this is uh, what ends up happening is their working memory is affected by this anxiety. So uh, as it says on here, the working memory is conceptualized as a limited source of cognitive systems responsible for the temporary storage and processing of information in momentary awareness. So one of the big places that you're going to use this in is in computational based tasks. So that obviously that's going to be used a lot in math classes and studies show that working memory capacity is a robust predictor of arithmetic problem solving and solution strategies. So to simplify what I just said, uh, because you even saw I was getting a little tongue tied with it, it just basically puts you in a uh, repeated cycle. So you have your math anxiety leads to the lack of working memory, which leads to low math performance. So if you're already having a low math performance, chances are you're leading into even more math anxiety because you're worried about what you're going to learn or what you maybe can't do. So something that's important to do is talk about what causes this math anxiety. So we're going to look at what is the causes for why students feel this kind of anxiety towards a specific subject. So there are many potential causes for math anxiety. So some of them listed here are language barriers. I know I have seen that personally. I come from a school that uh, has a very high ESOL population and I teach geometry. So what happens is I've seen some of these kids just be even nervous just to even try to talk to me because they don't speak the language very clearly. So they're worried to even ask me a question, let alone uh, have any anxiety with the math. You also have on here quality of instruction. I know I've been guilty of teaching a lesson and going, you know what, that's not the best way to teach it. There's always a better way to. So that's where uh, us as teachers really have to take that and decide how are we gonna be better next time we teach it. Uh, evaluation methods uh, with tests, especially students' math anxiety is gonna go through the roof. So there has to be, uh, a level of trying to calm them down and know that they can be successful and difficulty of materials. Now it goes on to also talk about the negative attitudes that can be inadvertently communicated by teachers and parents and the student uh, will then take these attitudes as well 
and broadcast it. So one of the things I see a lot with or when I'm talking to parents is they talk about how they were not successful in math and they hate that subject. Well, sometimes the students will hear that and think, well, if my parents weren't good at it, there's no way I can. So these are a few causes for math anxiety. So continuing on for our causes for this anxiety, uh, it goes on to say sometimes teachers focus too much on performance and grades, which makes students come to believe that their performance depends on their ability and that their ability is not sufficient. So sometimes we care so much about the grades and not necessarily enough about are they showing progress? Are they getting better? Because we want to try to praise that. And sometimes even the lack of mathematical skills is the cause and result of anxiety towards math. So some students know I did not do well in this class. So I've had many times where I've had kids coming from algebra, never done geometry, and sitting there going, already coming in with the attitude of, I'm not going to be successful because I wasn't that good at Algebra 1, where a lot of times that's not the case. So we talked about what causes the anxiety. Now what we're going to talk about is what does math anxiety lead students to do? A lot of times uh, with students with high math anxiety, what ends up happening is they use that anxiety to decide uh, future life decisions. So for example in here I talk about how it can lead to non-attendance, avoidance of mathematical courses, and by avoiding these math courses it can uh, make it so that they avoid certain careers. So they won't even give it a chance to become like on here the examples I give is engineers and wanting to work somewhere in economics. Now before I go on to what we as educators can do for the students to make it so that we can help them with their anxiety. Uh, what I want to talk about first is if there's any other stakeholders for the students that are affected by math anxiety. Now the answer to who else can be affected is, well it's us. The We as educators can sometimes really have this math anxiety. Uh, there was a study that I was looking at that showed that teachers of early childhood and elementary education uh, are the ones that have the most uh, levels of anxiety when it comes to this subject. So when, a, when teachers have this kind of anxiety, what you tend to see is they spend less time on the material, have less student participation, and have less student achievement. And instead of doing uh, more activities in multi-sensory instruction, you'll see a lot more of whole class instruction and a lower level of classroom discourse. This can be because you just don't feel comfortable with it or you're not sure about what kind of questions you're going to see. Now, luckily for us teachers, there are ways for us to manage that math anxiety. The best way to do this is to seek out specific courses or trainings on how to teach students math. Uh, in this study, which was done by some FSU researchers, by the way, go knows, uh, teacher math anxiety may be malleable and that math method courses could serve to reduce prospective teacher math anxiety. So this all leads us to the most important question, which is, what can teachers do to mitigate the math anxiety for students? So there are multiple strategies that teachers can do to help their students' math anxiety. Now, one of the things that I recommend, and like it says on here, is the focus on mastery goals. So mastery goals is when you put more effort into the process of learning and satisfaction is gained from the hard work and learning something new. So instead of work focusing so much on grades like we talked about before, we want to focus more on are the students learning? Are they getting better? So it's more uh, looking at their improvements and making sure they know that they can be successful as long as they keep trying. And we want to see uh, when we use this, 
real world application. So I know for me, I teach geometry, so it's a little bit easier typically to make it relate to the real world. Uh, for instance, we have volume. So I can actually just take a shape, fill it up, show them what volume actually is. And with us dealing with so many shapes, that's a little bit easier than let's say if they're in a algebra class. And with problem sol and then problem solving should take center stage. So we wanna see them improve and keep uh, showing progress. So I want to give you a few more strategies that you could possibly use to help this math anxiety. So the first uh, couple are, uh, you can do a survey to get to know the student's strengths and weaknesses. You can also, we also wanna provide a safe and supportive classroom. Now these first two strategies have to deal more with building relationships. I personally believe building relationships is very important uh, for the success of students because really what we need is for them to feel safe in our classrooms and feel like they're in a place where they're allowed to make mistakes because I know especially in math they are going to make mistakes they should be making mistakes because we are there to help progress them make them better if they didn't if they weren't making, uh, making mistakes there's no reason for me to be in there now some other strategies is to use uh, multi-sensory instruction. So we're trying to involve their other senses when they do this. This can be as simple as, let's say, using note cards that are different colors or, or using note cards where you're going over vocab that has an actual picture on it. Uh, you could also, one example I actually did in my classroom was we had a project that was going over cross sections. So what I would do is I would use Play-Doh and dental floss. So the Play-Doh, they would create uh, a 3D shape, let's say a cone, and then they would take the dental floss, cut through it, and see what shape it makes. So that's how I would teach them how, what a cross section is and how to introduce it to them. Now, uh, other things that you can do is make projects based on their interests. This again builds with building those relationships. If you know what their likes and dislikes are, you can make them more interested in the classroom. And then the last one I have listed on here is use a mix of the RTI model to identify struggling students and use intervention early. So for anybody that hasn't done uh, module three, quiz four, I'll give you a short uh, rundown of what the RTI model does. So it's a three-tier approach the where you're trying to identify struggling students real quick. So you start with a screener. So this could be a pretest, something like that. This way you can see right away which students might be, um, might be more inclined to be struggling. You can use that data to then monitor them. And during your general instruction, this would be the tier one. You're going to see if they're meeting those progress goals. The students that aren't doing this, you're gonna put them into tier two where they get more uh, intervention and a little bit more help. If they're still not progressing in that, then they will go to tier three, where you talk about maybe getting some extra support uh, with the ESE department or just get more support in general. So, but the main idea from this model that you would wanna take as a math teacher is make sure you're taking data. You want to see what they're doing. So use your formative assignments to really see what if they're actually progressing if they know what they're doing if not try to take a proactive approach and intervene with them that's the main idea of this now if any of you are interested in looking more into any of these and the articles that i used uh, here are the resources for you so i hope you enjoyed and i hope you found it informative have a great rest of the day